Hi, folks. Hi, folks. Hello. So I don't know if we concluded, but uh, we are here today at Smith Hill Reservoir, also known as Summit Reservoir or Summit Hill Park. It is a municipal park here in the city of Victoria. Uh, we are Special Bird Service. So my name is Zoe Blue. This is Ava and this is Jameson. Uh, we are a local bird watching group based here uh, in Victoria and also on the mainland uh, who work to provide outdoor uh, events for non-white folks or BIPOC. Uh, and we do this uh, with the purpose of creating a healing space and permitting um, everyone to learn about the outdoors, learn about birds, learn about nature, um, and really connect in a way that brings healing to community and builds community through outdoor activities. Mm -hmm. And today we are gathered at Smith Reservoir um, or Summit Hill Park on the lands of Wakwangan Sweet people, uh, Song Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. Jameson? Yeah, yeah, but this is also a uh, Sage territory as well. And uh, when we give that kind of territory acknowledgement, we want to be purposeful about uh, really our intention around it, which is, you know, uh, disrupting the colonial status quo of the attempted erasure of Indigenous peoples on these lands for the last couple hundred centuries and uh, really acknowledging that we at SBS are, we exist in unison and we uplift Indigenous voices as much as possible um, because it is Indigenous ways of being that are really at the center of caring for these lands and being in relationship with these lands and uh, getting to know the, the living beings all around us, whether that's the land, whether that's the birds, whether that's the plants. Um, yeah, I think it's really about appreciating the land and building a relationship with them. So we're excited to have you folks out here with us on this virtual uh, kind of intro to urban ecology. I know during, we had a, a community building walk right before this and Zoe Bu had talked a little, a little bit about how easy it is to get disconnected to the, the greenery and the living beings around us being in like urban centers. And mm. it's so easy to, um, start to begin to build relationships with the greenery and the life around you, even when you in or are in a downtown core. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think oftentimes living in a place as beautiful as Southern Vancouver Island, there are so many parks that are out of the city, um, so many places where you can bike for 20 minutes and end up alone on a beautiful ocean side. However, there is so much life inside of our city centers. Um, and so with this talk and also with the walk that we went on earlier, we really wanted to highlight the ways that, uh, yeah, the urban landscape is the land. It's as important to take care of, it's as important to learn about. And, you know, the rats, the silverfish, the spiders <laughs> that you see on a daily basis are as important to our ecosystem as, let's say, a golden finch? No. <laughs> that's not a bird uh, let's say a bald eagle um it's just as important and just as valid and just as important for us to take care of and learn about mm. these things are also the things that live alongside us and cohabitate with us in an urban landscape provide such a wonderful opportunity and gateway to begin that sort of learning journey and connection journey to the living things around us and getting curious and excited about them. That's another part of special bird service that we really like to facilitate is that curiosity and reconnection, especially birds. Birds are just about everywhere and it provides, they provide a great sort of gateway to curiosity and reconnection in that way. And I think here is a really great example of that. Uh, so. Ava mentioned during our walk earlier that this reservoir is actually a migratory place for um, for ducks. Ducks and, and waterfowl in the winter. Yeah, and so um, the other part of that is with all of the different water larvae that are coming up, such as mosquitoes and mayflies, we actually have a ton of uh, teal green swallows that are swooping all around the reservoir right now. So that's a really great way to learn about insects. And then the other part of that is you have all of the berries that can come up. And so during the opening moments of our live stream, you might have seen the blackberry bushes. So those blackberries are extremely yummy for us to make jam with, but they're also incredible foods for birds like robins. Mm -hmm. um, and so birds are a way to create a connection in the entire ecosystem that we see. And one really incredible thing about them is that they are extremely adaptable. And so we might have a lot of uh, native plants in this area, but we also have this reservoir that is made of cement and that was put here, uh, I guess, 100 or so years ago. That was for um, 
a res water reservoir for, uh, for the city's municipal use. Um, so we'll see today. We're going to explore in behind us is a karaoke ecosystem that has had a lot of restoration processes done to it by volunteers and community members to bring it to the sort of splendor that we'll see today. Um, and that's just adjacent to the cement reservoir. But I'd like to remind us that this is one contiguous stretch of landscape. And these two landscapes, though they're very contrasting, are connected. The birds utilize both parts of it and both of them share the same species of plants in some ways. And just like how our cities, they are patchwork quilts of parks and cement and housing. And yet here we are with uh, many living beings around us. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to walk down to the meadow? Let's do it. Sweet. Let's do it. Yeah. One thing, one cool thing that I've noticed in, in this, like around this reservoir, is the uh, violet green swallows that have been um, flying around. There's like in huge kind of uh, populations of them around here. But I just learned earlier today that they have um, something called a uh, saddlebag. Saddlebag. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> saddlebag and they have, almost have like an undercarriage underneath of their uh, just by their legs where they tuck them in while they're while they're flying and uh they're like as you're saying Ava about the their feet yeah their feet are um a swallow if you're not familiar the body plan is essentially a cigar shape with really sharp aerodynamic wings and so much so that they tuck their feet up in their undercarriage while they're swooping around and they're catching insects while they fly so cool. Yeah. <laughs> and they're a great urban bird and a great introductory bird to recognize. Oh, it might be yeah. hard to capture, but yeah. sure. We'll walk ahead of us. <laughs> <laughs> the males have a very rich violet green back to them. And as you can see, their breast is very white. And that saddlebag is kind of towards the, the back end. And you can see that white patch on their backside. I believe that's what they're referring to when they say saddlebag. Oh, hey, buddy. A great example of wildlife utilizing urban structures. <laughs> so we'll try not to disturb them the best we can. Their feet are so tiny. Yeah, yeah like I was saying, the feet are very tiny. <laughs> <laughs> and those wingtips are so long. <laughs> Have you had much experience with banding with the with the swallows? Uh, no, not particularly. <laughs> but I do know, like through different studies, uh, we do understand that these swallows are um, they are migratory species. So not only are they here in our urban landscape, they share la landscapes across the continent, north to south. They arrive here in the summertime and in the spring. And in the winter, by about September, in this part of the world, they'll be heading south to Central America. And they stay in Central America, in Mexico and Panama, um, and overwinter there, and do these same sort of behaviors, resting on wires and eating insects. And in the spring, again, they arrive here to breed. Um, because of that long distance migration, they face multiple threats as they travel. It's not just single problems in single locations. They're particularly vulnerable to multiple threats across landscapes. And as they migrate, they are utilizing um, different communities and different resources. And in a way, that's what I like about migratory species in particular. They sort of connect communities that otherwise might not be connected in that way. I'm kind of to add to that, I think that's a really important way that special bird service connects to the birds, right? Because all of us come from different places around the world. And so similarly, these birds have migratory patterns from south to north and back again. And a lot of our communities do as well, uh, whether we're from my family's from the African diaspora, 
and has gone north to Canada from the American South. And, you know, it's really incredible to think that these birds have patterns of traveling to some of our homelands and back again and connecting us to our homelands in ways that we didn't even think imaginable. Mm -hmm. wow. The kill green was the first swallow I ever learned about. Yeah. Because <laughs> they're white patch. Yeah. And oftentimes you can find uh, the barn swallows, they'll have rust patches underneath their bellies and they'll fly with the kill greens. Violet greens, yeah. Violet greens. Mm. They make um, mixed flocks. They're a similar sort of body plan and similar sort of diet. There are some barn swallows mixed in here and they are also a migratory species. I, mentioned on our walk earlier today as well. Uh, if you can imagine the sailor tattoo of the bird in flight, <laughs> that's a barn swallow and they're emulating that migratory journey that the swallows undertake. That's where sailors sort of resonate with that imagery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think uh, with this group being more and more into birding, like as we learn more, I, I, a, couple, a friend of mine's an ornith ornithologist uh, and he was like, one way of getting to know your environment around you is listening to the bird calls and mm -hmm. birding not necessarily in an identifying way which is super important but also birding in a way where you're actually intuitively getting to know the landscape that you're in mm -hmm. and like to me that's kind of what's what's pushing me in the birding direction is like to recognize the robin's call that i wake up to every morning or the the, the pigeons kind of purr for example mm -hmm. um yeah it's it's i i definitely like that aspect of birding as well mm -hmm. Yeah, one way that I've been doing that on a daily basis is there's an app called eBird um, and it's a really amazing way to get to know birds and, and to keep track of your birds and instead of biking to work on Sundays I'll walk so that's about a 15 minute walk and while I'm walking instead of listening to music or a podcast like I usually do I'll actually keep a bird list mm. so every morning I'll usually see the same 12 birds on my way to work because or if I'm like five minutes late I'll see a different bird and every day it's different and it's a really great way to practice it's a really great way you know as there's more construction there might be less birds in one area mm -hmm. it's pretty pretty cool yeah <laughs> yeah Just gonna add real quick that people, if folks have questions as we're going along, you're all okay with some questions. Absolutely, please mm. ask away uh, about the work that we do. Um, if you have any questions about Summit Hill Park, um, birds, plants. Any of the things we see today, we'll try our best to answer them. Mm -hmm. um, Chris will communicate them. He's our moderator today. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> we got a, there's four ducklings in the <laughs> reservoir. And oh my god! Yeah. There's so, oh, there's actually six of them. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So we've got three really mature. We got three mature ducklings, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, baby, baby ones. <laughs> Maybe if the crow stops cawing, we'll be able to hear them. <laughs> If folks at home are not familiar, uh, the ducks that we're seeing here today are mallard ducks. They're one of our most common uh, park species and one of the first birds a lot of people come to know. Mm -hmm. Sort of a, a spark of curiosity I've heard from a lot of folks in uh, connecting with the urban environment around them and their parks is learning that there's more than just mallard ducks as well. Yeah. We have lots of duck species right here sharing their waterways. Mm -hmm. And someone's left out some oats for them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually pretty fun. There's so many different types of people who, in my neighborhood, there's a uh, one guy who has um, dog food. There's another person who has peanuts. There's another person, uh, yeah, everyone has a different food that they feed to their crows. And so the crows know my neighbors by the foods that they give them. <laughs> you go ahead. <laughs> yeah, this area is so well known for the amount of camas that's in and around here as well. Mm. I know, I know you two are fairly well versed when it comes to canvas. <laughs> yeah. yeah, once we get down the steps, we'll actually be able to take a look at, at the canvas flowers. And canvas is um, 
a staple food of a lot of the local nations here um, and it's something that became a staple uh, trade trade item it's a starch uh, similar to a potato kind of looks like garlic i'm going to take a moment to highlight some of the flowers actually um beyond the chain link fence here we have low to the ground and fuzzy the purple flowers are a dwarf species of lupin or lupine uh, folks may understand lupins from garden centers they're actually quite common in gardens and this is a native species i suspect it's sort of volunteered and rooted itself on the other side of the chain link fence because lupins do not tolerate trampling so it's safe on that other side um, I see these popping up around the Southern Vancouver Island and CRD region. Uh, they're a great species once you sort of get familiar with it and the leaf layout and the way the purple flowers come up in a spike. You can't unsee it and you start to see it everywhere on the landscape. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another great one here is um, June plum or Oso berry. Uh, it is quite if you have any of the younger leaves, it tastes kind of like a cucumber, but within ethnobotany, it is uh, good for stomach aches. Uh, it's known as a blood cleanser. Um, and so one thing is that uh, when it uh, comes up, it's one of the first flowers and leaves to actually come up at the beginning of spring. So it's a great sign that spring is coming. Um, the berries are quite stony. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> More of a medicine than a dessert kind yeah. of thing. <laughs> um, during our walk, we were fortunate enough to be joined by um, Papakia. Um, and she was sharing some information about another plant, such as the uh, ocean spray or ironwood. Um, and it's quite amazing. It's, it's known as ironwood because um, it is such a hard wood to be used. So Papakia was, was teaching us about the ways that it is used to dig up canvas bulbs. Um, and Robin, another member of Special Bird Service, was talking to us about how some people use it for knitting needles uh, because it's so, so tough. Um, it's berries and seeds are also quite good for indigestion and stomach aches. Um, and I've heard that they're quite peppery, but I haven't had the joy of actually trying them myself. <laughs> this is a really common um, hardy shrub that grows in this part of the world. Uh, these are the flower buds, so they're not quite open yet. And the reason the name is ocean spray, referred to as ocean spray, is when these flowers do open up, it's, they're white and fluffy, and they look like a wave crashing. Yeah, and right now they're just in a bud state. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I believe Papakia was also sharing, Papakia's from the Wasing First Nation and was sharing, is very generous with their sharing in the SPS group and was talking about how when they started to, to bud as well, that was the the, the sign that, that salmon was ready for. Um, oh, yes, yeah. yeah. In the Salish Strait. In the Salish Strait. Yeah. 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 When the ocean spray begins to blossom, the salmon are beginning to return in the Salish Sea. Yeah, I've heard that a couple times. Mm. That's such a great example of living in tune with your environment and mm -hmm. the benefits of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. and I think when we talk about the continuing ancestral relationships with the land, I believe that's a, a huge indicator of that as well. Absolutely. All right, so we're heading down from the meadow. Chris, as we're walking, you might want to put, there's that uh, pathway on the learning portal about native plants from the south coast, because I think it mentions some of the plants we we're talking about. Yeah, I, I will do that, Liz. Thank you. Excellent. Head into the middle of here. Yeah. yeah. So this meadow has been restored over time. A lot of the meadows in our, in, in Victoria have been restored over time. Um, with that, I mean, there's a lot of amazing ways that there are groups such as uh, satin flower nurseries, um, hat. There's a lot of folks who are harvesting um, and saving the seeds from plants like camas 
um, to actually replant them in their own backyards. I know that Sunflower actually has a workshop on um, how to garden for dairy oak ecosystem. So if you have a backyard that has a whole bunch of dairy oak in it, but maybe we can take a look at one of these camas flowers if we can find one that's open. <laughs> that's it's kind of tricky that it's so wet outside. Um, <clears throat> I believe we mentioned at the beginning, but this is a perfect vista of a dairy oak ecosystem, really. Um, we have an open dairy oak trees dotting this savanna like very low uh, lacking an understory. And it's where grasses and wildflowers come up in abundance and hence we have the meadow tag on for that descriptor as well. Mm -hmm. um, historically, for thousands of years, this kind of ecosystem was dependent on seasonal fire regimes. Um, and since settlement and since contact that has been actively suppressed in this landscape, um, and something Papakia had also shared with us and that I've learned about is uh, prescribed burning for ecosystems such as this, where the trees, Gary Oaks are very fire resistant and it actually helps regenerate the soil seasonally. And they're not out of control wildfires, they're uh, wet season, low burning, low frequency, and it helps restore some of those properties that have been established in this system for thousands of years that have been now suppressed for a hundred. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, oh, here's an open canvas. Yeah. So here, I believe this is a small canvas or two varieties. They're relatively difficult to tell apart at first. Um, and it's the bulb of this flower. It's um, in the lily family. It's the bulb of this flower that was used and is used as a food staple to coastal First Nations within what is now called British Columbia. Yeah, and so in, in many nations you would, um, you gather that camas and that is your food staple. Um, I've heard that it's quite sweet like a potato, but I haven't had the joy of trying it myself. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Maybe soon. Um, yeah, but this meadow is just absolutely gorgeous. There aren't many places in the city where, where you can find camas just growing by itself like this. Oftentimes, you know, it's competing with things like Spanish bluebells, which there are a few of, um, mm -hmm. but it's just so plentiful here. And one of the important, one of the ways that it's so plentiful is actually because people are really using the paths and they're watching those signs. Mm -hmm. And as much as it's, you know, lovely to be in the wildflowers and to sit right on them and to have a picnic on them, that's that trampling actually prevents the flowers from being able to come up and show their beauty to the rest of the community. Mm -hmm. So watching your stuff is important in places such as these. Yeah. Um, another great plant that is right here is yarrow. It's this fuzzy one here. I don't know if you can see it, but it's this guy right here. Um, it's really good for adrenal fatigue. You'll often find it all over the city, but it has beautiful blooms. And I know that moths and butterflies really love it. Um, it is good for your heart. It's a, quite a powerful medicine that is oftentimes used for adrenal fatigue and for supporting your nervous system. Mm. And so all over the city, there's so many different plants that you can use for yourself, but also pollinators love, birds love, you know, and, you know, they form relationships too. And it's really important for us to form those relationships as well and get to know them better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It just, just like uh, learning a few of the local birds in your backyard, in your neighborhood, learning a few of the silhouettes and search images, have that in your mind of the plants that we've maybe talked about today or something that's growing in an empty lot near your house. Once you tune into that, you, so I joke, you can't unsee it. You begin to see them everywhere. And um, it's a connection. It's forming a connection and a broader network to the living things around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was a part of a lecture this past week that uh, Sarah Augustine was talking and she's a, a, a member, she lives on Yakima territory just down south. And she was talking about the power of healing with 
uh, your ground up being on on sorry your feet being on the ground I should say, and that's a, this is a way of walking that you know getting to know the plants that are around you and learning about the canvas and learning about the ways that they're actually able to heal and sustain you whether that's actually harvesting them or even witnessing and being watching your step around them mm -hmm. and getting to learn about them and that, I think that's that's applicable to the birds and that's applicable to the water and the, and the air that we breathe as well yeah Absolutely. and each one of them have a story to tell just like us as individuals and um at the museum a lot of the work that goes on at the museum is telling a broad range of histories and stories of folks uh, on these lands and coming in from beyond. Yeah. yeah, there's lots to learn here. Each bird has a backstory. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, and you can never, um, you never get to the bottom of that bucket either. Yeah. It's continual and it's dynamic. Yeah. yeah, I think oftentimes when you start to learn about things like birds, it can seem overwhelming. But sticking to one thing, yeah, can broaden your horizon like nobody's business you know mm -hmm. like you learn one name and then all of a sudden you're learning about the berries that they like to eat yeah. and how they relate to other birds and then you're talking to other people who might also have a different favorite bird mm -hmm. um and it's it's really a blessing and once you figure out the thing that you're obsessed with then you can talk to someone else and say, what are you obsessed with? And they go, oh, I'm obsessed with this bird. And they're like, no, wait, tell me about that bird and I'll tell you about my favorite bird. And that's like half the time that we are, you know, together with SBS is just kind of info dumping on each other about what yeah. our favorite pieces of, of nature are. Mm -hmm. And having separate bits of nature that we find really powerful can make it almost easier to learn from other people because yeah. that passion just passes through you so easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this isn't a question from, and uh, this is a question for me actually. How would the three of you answer that? In terms of oh, favorite bird? Yeah, or the thing that like that is your your passion in regard to this. I think we. I can't speak for all of us, but we all come from a sort of mixed bucket of passions for sure. Um, What's yours? Oh, I. I've always loved animals since I was a kid. Um, and I got into sort of watching the birds in my backyard because I learned birds are everywhere and you can never be bored if you're curious about birds. Um, so that's wonderful. I love learning about animals. So fish, I love bats, I love salmon. Um, and, I, and it goes beyond with their uh, diets and their habitat use. You quickly expand out into this broader systems that we're all a part of and that I participate in as well, learning about them. Yeah. yeah. So I like animals and all the things connected to animals. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I were to answer that question, I think uh, the more I learn about birds, the more I like them. And I know that I learn from the way that they exist in so many ways, the different kinds of calls that they have, for example, like learning the difference between songs and like alert calls between one another even like robins, like I said, like just learning robins and their early morning calls, like waking up to their songs is, mm -hmm. is such a powerful thing. And um, yeah, like I said, the more I learn about them, the more I enjoy them. Um, so I learn from them. Yeah. Let's say my greatest love, forever love is history. Um, and history has provided me with this beautiful way of looking at the world and connecting things that I learned about the past uh, with the things that I see happening right now. Um, so like looking at city records, for example, and learning that if there's a street on one side of the park that's on the other side of the park, then that street probably connected at one point. So there was probably restoration work that happened. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just like connecting things, mm -hmm. I guess, like the intricacies of it and also like forming knowledge pieces. I don't even yeah. know how if that's a passion, but I think that knowledge is my passion. <laughs> I wanted to be a librarian when I was a kid and, and now I just love learning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just never really want to stop, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. If I can if I can add to that as well, like one of the things I've I've been finding a lot of passion in is like learning the, the learning the Sanchatan names for for birds. Like um Papaki has been super generous in sharing like for example the Anna's hummingbird is Khajili is the name for it. And just like learning, you know, like I feel like in school, I, I was very disconnected from biology and it was like very siloed in what we, we learned. It was like 
very much an objective way of presenting these animals. And we know that they are living and constantly adapting to the environment, constantly mm -hmm. migrating. And learning the Sanchatan name is a first step to realizing the history of, these, of the birds on these lands and how there's been a historical relationship with these living mm -hmm. beings. And uh, yeah. Can yeah. you teach us that word? Can you say it again? The Swatjali is the name. Swatjali. Yeah. Swat yeah. So it's like S X E D J E L I, I believe. And Papakia is can probably help me out with that pronunciation, <laughs> pronunciation a bit more. But there's there's also like the Sanchat there's first languages, first voices language app and the Sanchatan Sanchatan language app. I personally have this in Chatham language app on my phone. And every time I see a bird, I'm like, I wonder what that bird is. And then I'll like <laughs> add it onto my bookmarks. Um, we were talking about it a couple of weeks ago because there was a birding group that was talking about Swainson's thrush. Um, and Swainson's thrush here is uh, the salmonberry bird. Mm -hmm. And so I can't remember the Sinchotham name off the top of my head, but its song is what calls salmonberries to ripen. Yeah. Whereas the English name is. I'm sure Swainson was a fine fellow. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't describe the seasonality of the bird and how it arrives in the spring and begins to sing that song that ripens the berries. Like it gives you a more encompassing uh, picture of how it connects to the landscape. And I think that's just one of very many reasons for picking up a few indigenous language words um, that are available to you. And it's just another really useful lens to connect with the living things around you mm -hmm. again. And I think oftentimes people learn languages so that they can, you know, you want to learn Italian, so you go to Italy, or you want to learn Mandarin, and so you can cook cook Chinese food. And mm -hmm. a, a lot of the time with Sinshothan, it's a really incredible way to learn about the place where you live, yeah. right? Like we are so fortunate to have these resources around us and have so many language language learners and teachers who are willing to answer your questions and, and you know, places like UVic where they actually have language courses. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that it's it's really important that we connect with nature in this way um, so that we can actually respect the, the ecosystems that we're seeing and not just see it as a, you know, them versus us, but also to see it as we have a responsibility to these lands as, mm -hmm. as people that live here. Yeah. Yeah, and as occupiers too. Yeah. yeah, I think like cultural humility is kind of a, a word that which comes to mind when you're saying that. Absolutely. Like walking in a way instead of like extractively wanting to learn and like attain a full knowledge of their culture and their languages, it's like a, a humility and, and a curiosity really to mm -hmm. appreciate the land that we have. Mm -hmm. so. If I can just add, it's 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 Liz behind the camera again. Um, Chris, there's also First Peoples Cultural Council. Matt yeah, I Page. actually. I just oh, put great. that art. <laughs> Excellent. We can't I, see it. I beat you to it, Liz. Um, awesome. I put the First Voices apps uh, right. both on Facebook and. Um, that's yeah. across, not just on the island, that's across what yeah. we now call British Columbia. Yeah. So it's, it's a really amazing resource. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I also wanted to say that um, Liz, uh, that Lois from Facebook made had a comment that said, I've noticed the birds more since COVID, probably because I'm home more. Um, so I'm, I'm, maybe if, if anyone could speak just to the last two years in particular, how that shifted sort of bird awareness. No pressure. Uh, I think um, <laughs> it's a thing. <laughs> um, it's been quantified uh, by ornithologists and social scientists. There have been a few studies looking at the uptake of hobbies more broadly but specifically bird watching has seen the biggest boom in decades mm -hmm. <laughs> since the start of the pandemic, honestly. Yeah, I mean, I can speak from my own personal experience. I was in a two bedroom apartment alone for like two months and the people that I saw the most frequently weren't people, they were crows. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I started feeding the crows like leftover food because I was like, well, I have a garden. I might as well have a friend the crows in my neighborhood. <laughs> and it was so nice. And this year I'm trying to grow flowers so that I can get the hummingbird back because now that the crows are there, the, the hummingbird's territorial. And so, yeah. But I think that's a big reason why we started in 2020, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was like this, I mean, like for one, like this idea that like we have, like non-white folks have a right to take up space in outdoor spaces, yeah. but also because we were so isolated and we wanted to 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 have a sense of community 
especially mm -hmm. outside where it was, you know, safer than gathering when, when gathering was actually quite limited indoors. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And something focused on something, again, as accessible as birds. Mm -hmm. They are everywhere in every really? landscape. Mm -hmm. And even um, like we were speaking to earlier, the perception of birds, it's not just watching, it's listening and sensing in other ways. Yeah, absolutely. Also, bird watching goes both ways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we were being watched at all times. All, right all times. <laughs> yeah, we were at um, Killarney, which is right by Prospect Lake. Some people call it the Secret Lake or Eagle Lake. Um, right by Heartland Dump, and I was watching an eagle, and it was just watching me the entire time. <laughs> I was watching it. And it's kind of spooky. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big thing. <laughs> Yeah, and I think I think to uh, to Lois's point again as well, like being at home and being present in that way, like a lot of mm -hmm. for I think for a lot of folks, the pandemic was that kind of forced introspection and forced uh, time alone. And like when we actually take that pause, and the birds, we we have that kind of opportunity and space and time to appreciate them a little more too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was a big part of why we started. <laughs> yes, there's crows dancing over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's a big part of why we started SBS like in 2020 when pandemic hit like you know a lot of social justice issues came to light as well and and like us as people that are operating on in like the white dominant culture here and also like really taking intentional time for reflection and community building and community healing together mm -hmm. the birds were an integral part of that yeah i think i think one thing that happens oftentimes as a history nerd like in in times of global crisis people tend to cling to the things that are most important to them and one of the coolest things was how little cars we saw. I mean, speaking on my behalf, but not having cruise ships coming and bringing tens of thousands of people into the city was kind of awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, and another part of that was like, you literally couldn't do anything but walk around. <laughs> there, was, there was nothing else to do. And so I think that's something that I've really been hoping is gonna stay with us for the rest of my lifetime, mm -hmm. you know, is that an appreciation of the slower moments. Yeah. because a lot of the time we move so quickly in our day to day that yeah. having that reminder of like okay well you know my job isn't everything I can actually enjoy this nature I can enjoy the crow that I see every day yeah. is such a gift to have and I think that that's one thing that SBS really does is, is like exemplifies that that community mm. and time to be grounded and be mindful with each other is essential to survival you yeah. know yeah yeah those simple moments of uh, mindfulness and awareness um, and with the simpler things in life stopping to smell the flowers and listen to the birds sing and connecting that's what we're really trying to emulate today with this uh, talk yeah. those were violet greens overhead <laughs> i don't know if the audio caught that um, Hmm. Do the viewers have any other questions about maybe the plants around us today or questions for us more broadly? Not a question, just a comment that you're uh, just appreciating how you you three are such passionate guides. <laughs> comment, so. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone can be a passionate guide. <laughs> <laughs> we are all passionate guides. <laughs> yeah. Also, like, join us. <laughs> Do you want to say something? About yeah. yeah. If you'd like to join us, um, if you have Instagram, there uh, is spe at Special Bird Service. You can also Google Special Bird Service, uh, and our website should come up. It's specialbirdservice.com. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think so. um, we have yeah, our newsletter. Instagram yeah. newsletter as well. Nice. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's kind of cool to see like the different groups of people that come to join us. And, mm. and it was so nice to be able to share our community with, with the museum today, last month, and then on Thursday again at the, uh, at the BAD event. And this is such a beautiful ongoing uh, collaboration to have. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to have a, a takeover with the Royal BC Museum's Instagram account on uh, Sunday, May 22nd for the International Day for. Uh, biological diversity i believe ooh. and uh yeah, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i think the theme for this year is building a shared future for all life and i think mm -hmm. that really is applicable to what we're what we're uh, about at sbs so tune in tune into the uh, royal bc museum's instagram account or our instagram account 
uh, for that takeover on Sunday, yeah. the 22nd. Yeah, absolutely. Great. We, uh, I, I put the link um, to special bird service in both uh, Facebook and Zoom. One question from uh, Karen on Zoom, and maybe it's a good close just to remind uh, us where where you are, and if if anyone anyone is joining from um, Victoria, uh, where exactly is is this park that you're at? Right. So this is um, Smith Hill Reservoir or Summit Hill Park. It is listed on the Capital Region Districts municipal parks website and we're located adjacent to quadra village so quadra and topaz quadra topaz and hillside it's a small green square on the map and this is what it turns out to be <laughs> and i really encourage folks i came to discover it that way just looking on a map finding a green square and wandering there for the first time yeah. that is a wonderful way to get curious about the landscape around you we are really uh, really fortunate to have many parks in southern Vancouver Island, but maybe in the city where you're in as well. Um, getting curious and going out and maybe getting familiar with some of the locals. <laughs> so, uh, so, we, so this is Jim Zoe Blue. This is Ava. This is Jameson. And uh, we're special bird service. Uh, thank you so much for having us and we hope to see you again soon. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for joining us today. I hope you took something with you and I hope you can all get curious about the fellow living things that share the landscapes with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Thanks for the conversation. <laughs> Found it. <laughs>